Hi, I'm Smokey Sumac. I'd like to welcome all of you, our settler friends, our my indigenous relations, our black relations, our black and indigenous relations, all our mixed relations, um, all the kids that are watching out there, all the family members, all the dogs, um, everybody, all the res dogs, hi to the res dogs in the backyard. Welcome to the Indigenous Voices Awards Gala for 2020. I know what you're thinking. This isn't much of a gala. You're in your living room, Smokey. Yes, I have to acknowledge I am. I am in my living room because as we know, there's a global pandemic and the Indigenous Voices Awards are saddened that we don't get to gather in the way that we used to, but we're also very excited to bring you a virtual gala, a virtual awards show. Um, so, I know last year we got to we got to spend time together in Musqueam at UBC at the beautiful First Nations Longhouse. Uh, the year before we were in Regina, and this year I'm coming to you from Amakis Tunaka. So for those of you who don't know, I moved home. Honene Tunaka. I am Tunaka, and I am from uh, this nation. Some, sometimes it's anglicized as Kootenai, um, and I live in a town that most people call Kimberly, British Columbia. And I considered filming outside because it's really beautiful and the mountains are incredible. But there's a guy mowing his lawn and yesterday there was a bear and her cubs. And I just thought it's probably safest for me to do it here. But I'm bringing you some of the mountains from a local Kimberly artist. So I hope you, uh, I hope that, well, I will say I think we're excited about this virtual gala because what it means is people who couldn't join us in person get to see it. So wherever you are, whether you're reading from bed and waiting for your coffee or whether you're scrolling in a parking lot, hopefully with, with a mask on and uh, socially distancing, we hope that you're safe. We hope that you're healthy and we're, we're grateful that you're here. So for those of you who aren't aware of what, what we do, who we are and what we do, uh, the Indigenous Voices Awards was established in 2017 to support Indigenous writers, emerging Indigenous writers. And for me, the coolest thing, and it's probably because I got a little fight in me, but uh, the coolest thing about this award is that it's really, it's really fighting back against cultural appropriation and against the folks who think that they can tell our stories better than we can. And so this award says that we are the best people to tell our stories and it celebrates that, it honors that, and it lifts these voices up. Personally, I won the award, I actually won uh, two of these awards, one in unpublished poetry in English, and then my book actually came out in 2018 and I was honored to, to win again. And last year at the gala, I was, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to get emotional here, I was very, I, I cannot, I can't, I'm a poet and I can't find words to explain to you what it meant to have uh, Indigenous literary auntie Jeanette Armstrong read one of my poems as she, as she in, invited me to read on stage. Um, and, and I think with that, I want to honor all of the voices that came before us. I would, I would give you a list of those literary aunties and uncles, but there are so many that I, I will not be able to remember them all. And then I'll feel guilty and then I'll have them calling and, so I'm not going to try. I will say that I think these awards, they connect us to a tradition of thousands of years of storytelling, of 50 years of published work. Um, and they connect us to those aunties and, and many of them who have passed on, those uncles, those elders, those grandparents, those family members of our Indigenous literary community. Uh, all of them are two-spirit people, our siblings, our cousins um, in this community. What you're gonna see today is emerging indigenous writers. You're gonna get to see the short list. Everyone is gonna read because while there is a winner, while we have to pick and you know somebody gets the award, really in our community, it's about this, this whole thing is about these voices and lifting them up. So they are connected to their ancestors, to all of this history that we have of writing and making space for each other. And they're also connected to an Indigenous literary future, which I honestly, we cannot even keep up with. There is Indigenous literature in every single genre, and you will see different categories today that will show you that. Um, and I am going to be your host. I'll be jumping in and out. And and I almost forgot because, because I'm filming this in advance. But for you, happy Indigenous Peoples Day. I think this is a super 
uh, exciting way to spend it and to celebrate. And I hope that um, if you're a settler ally out there, you buy one of these books right away um, and you keep an eye on these these writers that are unpublished because they'll have books to buy soon. You can also still donate to our awards. So I highly, if you're sitting on a pile of cash, I highly encourage you to click those links. And if you're not, if you're somebody who maybe can't afford or maybe has a family mouths to feed, then, you know, support it at your local library. You can actually support our literature in that way. And that helps us because our books continue to get ordered. There continues to show that there's a thirst for Indigenous literature. And um, so we're just grateful to all our supporters. I hope you have an amazing time today listening to these writers. And uh, my heart is happy. I'm, I'm excited to share with you and excited to be here with you. So um, here we go. <laughs> Mayasu is born of the Deniza tribe. She is blessed with the skin color of the deep soil of Mother Earth and hair black like raven's wings. She has never failed to mirror my potential back to me when I was unable to see it. Mayasu's praying hands, weathered, wrinkled, and cracked, speak of hardships held and burdens carried. These arthritic, aged, hands move purposely and are capable of swift but gentle gestures. With the same beautiful brown fingers that count rosary, rosary beads, she has cradled my face and raised my eyes to meet hers. In that gaze lives the warmth of a thousand home fires, an acceptance that I could not give myself in the strength of a love to which I have blinded myself. A city that sits on the North Saskatchewan with histories of fort makers and Papa's Chase garden thieves and land stolen so that people today can sit in their million dollar homes while they look out their windows and say to themselves, isn't this pretty? There are some parts of the city that they prefer to look away from. They look away from the migrating swarms of worn out looking folks east of city center, the black bags and shopping carts that swim upstream toward the bottle depot each day by the six o'clock closing. They look away at night when they walk beneath the white breast in the sky, and they look away while teens wander alleys selling mom's medicine cabinet. Look away while a crying teenager runs out of an apartment building with only a towel wrapped around her. Look away when a guy dressed in all black walks toward the bridge. Look away when the teenagers sneak out into the night with their black jean jackets and glowing green hair. Fifty-seven years of love. On October 14, 2015, I graduated from York University. As I stood waiting to collect my degree, I smiled at Lucy and her mother, who were sitting in the audience, then patted my left breast pocket, which held my grandmother's picture. I swear the picture glowed over my heart as my name was called. I walked across the convocation stage took the Chancellor's hand, and accepted my degree. I'm sure my grandmother was there with me, cheering me on, proud that I had found my way and that I kept the promise I'd made to her. Grandma never did get to see me sober or out of trouble with the law, nor did she ever meet my wonderful wife, Lucy. Lucy now wears my grandmother's engagement ring a surprise gift from Aunt Sherry after I told her over dinner one night at her house that I wanted to marry Lucy, but mentioned that I couldn't afford a ring on a student budget. You can have the most precious ring of all, Aunt Sherry said to me. She got up, went past Uncle John, got her jewel case, and pulled out a dusty box. 
The two of them were just beaming. It's your grandmother's wedding ring. Fifty-seven years of love on there. She'd want Lucy to have it, I'm sure. I like to think Aunt Sherry was right, and that Grandma sent Lucy to take care of me. She's the only woman strong enough to watch over Grandma's wayward, rebellious grandson. Hello everyone. I'm so honored to be here and to be have, to have been nominated for the Indigenous Voices Award. I'm in such good company. I really can't believe I'm in this company. So I'm very excited. And I'm going to read one poem from my chapbook, I'm Still Too Much, published by Rahil's Ghost Press in, two, in spring 2019. This poem is called 1999. Recollect the glacial lake in the eye of my mother. Standing in the fan of Lake Agassiz, her wide hands on my back against the wind of a leveled plain, a canticle. This fertile valley, synchrony of silt and water split into three by rivers and me, cold ply of fingers on my sister against a wall of neon VLT. This gamble of glacial water, prairie noise, the nickel-plated satisfaction of waiting for the rise of ice on the river bank and my mother's seasons measured by quarters running low. Who knows her habits? Who knows where she'll be tomorrow? My face reflected in hers, so alike in water, porous, plump, identical. Again, thank you so much for listening, and thank you so much for nominating me. Um, yeah, thank you. Hi. My name is Francine Cunningham, and I have been shortlisted for the Indigenous Voices Award in the Published Poetry uh, English category for my book, On Me, that was published with Caitlin Press in October 2019. Um, so I'm very excited to be able to share with you a poem from this book. The poem that I'm going to share with you is called On Family, Grandmother. All right. <sighs> Taken. Can her story really be told without that word? Taken off reserve, away from her family, away from her land, away from her language, away from everything she knew. Taken. Her hair, her innocence, herself. Taken. To a new life in a city that settled her in a settler city, in a new home with new family members. Taken to an Indian sanatorium one winter night, met an Indian man who took her into his heart and who she took into hers. Taken, with nine children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren, taken into history. But it started off by being taken. Thank you for listening. And I very much look forward to seeing everybody at the virtual celebration for the Indigenous Voices Award. This award means so much to me. I think it is one of the coolest awards in Canada. And I am so thankful to be on this list with all these incredible authors who I admire so much. And I'm just very, very excited. And so, yeah, I just want to say thank you again to all the jurors um, and to all the writers, the Indigenous writers in Canada who've sort of paved the way uh, for us younger emerging writers and have made it just so much easier and so much more accessible and so much more exciting to uh, be an Indigenous writer in Canada today. And thank you to you, all of you readers and all everyone who supports our work. Um, yeah. It's pretty amazing. So you can uh, find me online at francinecunningham.ca, on Instagram at francinecunningham, and Twitter at francinebarbara. So yeah, thank you.
I adore the mundane, especially when my mind needs peace. At times it feels like craziness exists just to mystify my double-winded insides apart. Confused by this move to my homeland, the many obstacles that inadvertently invaded my path of contented, passionate pursuits. My strength lies with gentle reminders from family that I have historical roots, pride and joy of my bloodline. Ancestors who lay the foundation as guardian angels by my side. With that in mind, I say this prayer to the full moon tonight. May the Creator sprinkle strength, wisdom, and guidance. May I humbly walk as a grateful student on Mother Earth today. May I have an open heart of forgiveness and lightness with every step I take. May the lessons be swift and compassion be my gift. May the joys of living govern my talents so that sharing is my tool. May the foundation I lay be the cornerstone of peace and happiness. Thank you. Happy land. Nobody called it happy land back then. We didn't know happy land existed, but that two street highway community of ours is most certainly there if you zoom out far enough in Google Maps. People just called it the house or east side for 2073 or Washago, which swallows every highway community within a few kilometers or so. Sometimes I called it Wasega Beach when I was too little to tell the two apart. But the internet tells me we lived on the east side of Happy Land, just across the freeway. And there must be something there if the internet tells you there is. Obrigado, miigwech, thanks. Take care. I only have two treatments left, I say into the night. Wow, what happens after that, Teresa asks. I guess I'm cured, I say, although no one's willing to use that word. I can't believe we're almost through this. I add, I'm sorry. Sometimes I think about how much of our lives have been centered around me for the past two years and I feel guilty. I stole our parents from my sister and brother. Vacations and parties had to be scheduled around my chemo schedule. Every 28 days, I'd make my way to the hospital with one or both of our parents. Important birthday dinners, hockey or volleyball games, report cards, celebrations, recriminations were always second importance to how I was feeling. What the fuck are you sorry for? I laugh at Teresa's response. She's generous in a way she doesn't have to be. Are you excited about being done, she asks. I guess so. No one will say I'm cured, though. So how done can I be? Everyone expects me to be happy to be finishing chemo. Chemo sucks, yeah, but it's better than dying. Hating treatment is easy for people to understand. Being afraid is trickier to explain. Yes, the drugs are killing me, but they're killing the cancer faster. I start putting words around an anxiety that has been with me for a while. This is going to sound messed up, I say. As fucking hard as chemo is, at least I feel like I'm doing something, not just sitting around waiting for my body to betray me. A tear slips out of the corner of my eye. I want to wipe it away, but I also don't want to spill my beer. There's silence. 
Everyone else would have been filled with advice. You have to be strong, Trina. You have to believe, Trina. You have to want to live, Trina. Negative feelings bring negative results, Trina. Not Teresa. Fuck, I'm lucky to have her. Look, up there on the left, a satellite. Do you think Mom has them checking on us, she says? Nice redirection, I laugh. My hand moves to cover my beer bottle. You can never be too sure in this life. If anyone had the ability to guilt someone into redirecting a satellite to check on their kid, it would be my mom. I can see the Big Dipper, but I can never find the North Star, Teresa says. Me either. Dad would be disappointed in us. We sit in silence. Are you worried it'll come back, Teresa asks. Every fucking day, I answer, rubbing my thumb over the IV path that's burned into the back of my hand. Me too, Teresa says. That, this, is why I love her. She asks questions no one else has the courage to ask and actually wants to hear my answers, my fucked up, complicated answers. Not the cherish every day as a gift, cherish every sunrise crap that other people are looking for. I lie back in the grass and I feel it poking through my shirt. It tickles the back of my legs, rubbing against my sunburn. I can smell the green. It smells like life. It's growth and change and rot. We watch the sky for falling stars, and I can hear her breathing. Tonight is a good night. For now, that's enough. Willow Quartet, an air in the moment. The cold gray rain says it all, like cathedral bells when the king is dead. Schrodinger's cat will be played by her sister, waiting for the phone call that will open the box. Did the radiation in this case cure her? Or will it be a long, quiet drive through the mountains to say goodbye? The phone rings. It's just a telemarketer. Try to relax. It gives us time to brace ourselves. Months of radiation will have taken its toll. Will we even recognize her? Emaciated, hair missing. The cold gray rain says it all. All the plans washed away. Stuck inside on a Saturday. Waiting for the phone to ring. Hi, my name is Corey Daniels, and I'm going to read my poem called A Memory of Mary. Mary carried me for nine months, and in the document I have from Alberta Social Services, Mary was described as a dark-haired, dark-skinned Métis woman who was well-groomed at the time of my birth. Mary enjoyed crossword puzzles and reading. Mary was 5'7 and weighed 165 pounds at the time of my birth. Mary had many siblings and a child before me, but that child was being raised by someone else. No more information was provided. Mary was 24 years old. Mary worked as a waitress. Mary gave birth at the Holy Cross Hospital. Mary was not allowed to hold me or see me at the time of my birth. Mary eventually married Fred and she lived her life. Mary eventually told me on the phone in 1998 that she had thought of me every single day. I spoke to Mary on the phone a few times, but then we lost touch because I was afraid and so was Mary. Mary passed away in 2003. I found out about her death nine months later. Thank you. Buttertown Beach. Notoe Oma for my father. As we sat on two splits of wood, two splits of wood we called bench seat, the wet of the earth was not as prevalent as that of your brow, for time work then was less than time work now. 
in your workings as you worked all day. You worked your way down closer, closer my way. You bore me through the image of a sun-worked hand, often the only nectar in the fields of sugar beets lie in your hands. It was in the yard, head rested upon the family dog, the one named for his coloring, as you watched through the window that I imagined being your height. And again, in your workings, you worked your way down closer, closer to mine. As I counted the lines near the water in the sun-bleached clay, the farthest being softened by the damp and the nearest having been washed away, on the two splits of wood, the two splits of wood we called bench seat, you felt as soft as fen as the sands on Buttertown Beach. We are still here. Each us. Dangerous. It's all right if we make arts and crafts. It's not all right if we partake. When some gain to mowing staffs self-determination. The power of spirit, man, I do. We see win, steep in the gift, too deep to keep in a reservation. Nichas, dangerous, mother our blood and bone, gather to light the sober wing of scorn. Sweet grass, bright with transformation, reconciliation, then we'll see the first glint of Bonain de Moen, fire and flint. Life is sincere in the Ojibwe camp, and oh, we are still here. I was say, a grizzle. Wait, hello everyone. This is Phyllis Webstad. I'm from the Shtwachem Chatham First Nation, Kennel Creek Dog Creek, outside of Williams Lake, BC. We are part of the Shawetan Nation. My book is called Phyllis's Orange Shirt, and I'll read a bit for you out of the book. Little Phyllis lived with her granny on the Dog Creek Reserve. They would pick berries, garden, and catch fish to preserve. There were not many kids with whom Phyllis could play because they went to residential school far, far away. One day Granny took Phyllis to town. It was exciting to see so many people around. Granny took Phyllis to a shop full of clothes with hats for your head and socks for your toes. Phyllis picked out a shirt that was so orange, shiny and bright and Granny bought it for her to wear with delight. On the first day of residential school, Phyllis just couldn't wait. She wore her orange shirt so that she would look great. But when she arrived, her mood started to change. 
the place was so cold, unfriendly, and strange. Her bright orange shirt was taken away, and she worried about how long she would stay. At public school, she was taught how to read and write neatly by her teacher who treated her so very sweetly. Phyllis liked her teacher but missed her granny so bad, along with the garden and home that she had. And then when summer finally arrived, Phyllis returned to the home where she thrived. We wear our orange shirts to remember that every child matters and not just in September. We honor First Nations people and reflect on how every child is special and deserves our respect. And that is my orange shirt. Phyllis's orange shirt. Thank you. Hello again, and thank you and congratulations to all of the English category winners and our shortlist. I've been in this field for a long time, and there was a time where we, uh, we knew all the Indigenous literature that was coming out. We were aware of what was coming out. And now, in the last five, maybe even ten years, it's impossible for us to keep up. So the most exciting thing for me about these awards is that I get introduced to new work. And I hope that you go out and find these books and these works and, and keep an eye out for these works because um, it's just, it's an exciting time for Indigenous literatures. So up next, we have something really special for you. Did you know that the IVAs are the only award for French language Indigenous literatures in the world? So this is really exciting. And you're going to hear from a few French language readers. And you're also going to hear from a host that is much better at speaking French than I am. Um, grateful to my uh, French teacher, Madame Ballard, for I'm going to do my best at some pronunciations here. But uh, forgive me, JD, if, if I get these wrong. But the first shortlisted reader that I'm, I have the pleasure and privilege of introducing tonight is JD Curtness, whose book Aquariums L'Instant Mim is up for this year's award. But JD is also a familiar face to the Ivas because she won in 2018 for her book De Vengeance, uh, which has been translated to English as Vengeance, I believe. So the exciting thing about this work, and the exciting thing for me personally, um, who, who is not fluent in French, and uh, who, you know, I only have a bit of time for language learning and trying to stick to Tunoka language learning, but that said, these books are doing really well in French, and then they get translated into English. And I think of one of our indigenous literatures, uh, a literature uncle sort of of, of Thompson Highway, who I think his work has been translated into 40 or 50 languages. So that's the kind of thing I want to see. I want to see our literatures spread all over the world and shared all over the world because our work matters and is exciting. And you're going to see that up next. So uh, with, without further ado, I hope you enjoy the rest of the French language categories. Une odeur. Une odeur qui remplit les pores, riche et délicieuse. L'odeur de la nourriture. La sensation le percute au milieu du néant. Elle modifie son état de veille. Son pouls s'accélère. De grands battements de queue le font avancer, lentement. Le requin nage trois heures. Les craquements sourds de la surface se rapprochent. Leur vibration enveloppe son corps d'une caresse familière. Elle gagne en intensité à mesure que l'eau se fait moins dense. Ses muscles se contractent à peine. Sa masse sombre glisse vers le haut, quelques mètres par minute. Chaque élan lui coûte une énergie précieuse. Les occasions de manger sont rares. Ombre parmi les ombres, il plane comme une raie entre les courants. L'eau est si froide qu'elle devrait, qu devrait être gelée. Le sel, les marées et la pression la gardent à l'état liquide. La banquise chante au-dessus de lui. 
Son tonnerre vibre dans la noirceur glaciale. Des secousses graves qui excitent tous les nerfs du squal. La vie existe aussi là-haut. Un monde d'une vitesse inouïe, suffoquant de chaleur et de lumière. Jadis, il regardait l'épaisse couche de glace chatoyée, vert ou bleu dans la lumière vive, orange et rose au passage du soleil sur l'horizon. La nuit, des milliers de créatures brillaient, électriques et multicolores. Il perçoit encore le fourmillement de leur existence, mais il ne les voit plus. Maman, oui les gens n'ont pas le droit d'être racistes, hein? En fait, oui, ils ont le droit. Les gens peuvent ne pas t'aimer, peu importe la raison. Ils peuvent te rejeter parce que tu es un garçon, parce que tu es un enfant, parce que tu es sensible, parce que tu n'aimes pas les sports, parce que tu as l'âme d'un artiste et aussi parce que tu es inou. Et tu sais, mon cœur, ça va arriver. Parfois, les gens ne t'aimeront pas parce que tu es différent. Ils ne trouveront pas dans leur cœur assez d'espace pour ta différence. Ils riront peut-être de la forme de ton visage, de la couleur de ta peau, de tes cheveux raides, de notre histoire, de nos danses, de nos habits traditionnels, de notre langue. Parfois, ils seront plusieurs et toi, tu seras seul. Et ça te fera souffrir, évidemment. Ça fait souffrir de ne pas être aimé. Mais sache une chose, mon cœur. C'est le seul pouvoir qu'ils auront sur toi. Il n'y a rien qu'ils pourront faire pour t'empêcher d'atteindre les buts que tu te donnes, les études que tu auras choisies, le travail pour lequel tu postuleras, la femme que tu aimeras, les causes dans lesquelles tu t'engageras, les enfants que tu élèveras, les pays que tu visiteras. Aucune haine ne pourra te prendre un millième de ton avenir. Puis un jour, tu verras, ça viendra. Tu constateras que tout ce que tu fais d'exceptionnel vient de ta différence, parce que tu auras choisi de t'aimer tel que tu es. Oui, je m'appelle Maya Cousineau Malone de la nation Inno. Ishkuteotapen. Le métro Asylum, des corps errants, si lent, si silencieux. Tous nous sommes dans ce très mystère qui cache nos tourments, nos questions. Gardien des quêtes, des nuits débridées, il ramène patiemment ses brebis erratiques. Au roulement doux du berger de métal, il endort les confidences reçues. Les miennes partiront au matin du soleil blafard, souvenir de chuchotements d'euphorie. Je suis le mystère de ma solitude, je marche, aimé de mes fantômes. Takurupanu Enfant du nord furtif, énigmatique, silencieux, cultivant son mystère au souffle du Chewetan, cherchant dans les volutes de sauge la rédemption libératrice. Marche comme tu caresses le territoire, Habité du respect des rites anciens, avec le don de sculpter le vide de l'espace pour ces peuples oubliés du temps. Est-ce une vie ancienne qui te hante dans ta quête de beauté frissonnante? Continue sur le sentier des secrets territoriaux, mu par le sentiment d'urgence, tel le saumon bercé par l'appel des origines, appelé par l'instinct des finalités. Par-delà le temps et les frontières immatérielles, reviens à la rivière du cercle de tes ancêtres. Nous mouchons tata, afin d'accueillir tes récits. Nous comme t'espère, toi son fils rebelle. Merci, tu n'as qu'à maintenant. L'amour, c'est une forêt vierge puis une coupe à blanc, dans la même phrase. T'es la pâle d'épinettes noires qui brûle mon cœur full de super. 
C'est juste impossible que tu viennes plus t'abreuver à mon esprit ancestral de crème soda. Des fois, je ferme les yeux, puis je fais comme si j'étais là. Tu mets du choke, tu tires ça à crinque. Ça décolle dans un nuage noir. Il est tombé pas mal de neige. Faudrait pas rester en rack, j'ai même pas de soute. Tout ce qui m'entoure ressemble à la phrase « être à la bonne place ». Tu contournes les arbres dans la nuit, tu vires sur un dixième. Les branches dans le front, les flocons d'un yeux, c'est sûr que c'est pas avec toi que je vais rester pris. Je me dis que ça ferait un beau titre de quelque chose. Il danse avec les skidous. J'espère qu'il y aura tout le temps une craque dans la porte, un petit jour entre les lignes de notre histoire. Mais là, j'avoue, J'aimerais troquer mon cœur pour la simplicité d'un bon bol de macaroni aux saucisses. Je laisse le territoire m'éparpiller, comme les oiseaux migrateurs savent pas se perdre. Je touche du bois, je ferme ma bouche, mais je continuerai quand même à le dire dans les silences de la portée. Si vous me cherchez, je suis chez nous, ou quelque part sur une tassinane. Toutes mes portes et mes fenêtres sont ouvertes. Chauffe le dehors. Quoi, quoi? Euh... Je m'appelle Pierrot Rostremblé, ici Pionneau, professeur à l'Institut de recherche et d'études autochtones de l'Université de Lavoie et surtout membre du jury de voix autochtone 2020. Alors le prix Voix autochtone reconnaît chaque année nos artistes, nos écrivains de partout au pays, dans diverses catégories, dans nos langues ancestrales et aussi en français et en anglais. L'année la dernière, j'ai eu l'immense privilège d'être nominé et invité avec plusieurs autres écrivains des premiers peuples à la magnifique cérémonie de remise des prix à l'Université de Colombie-Britannique, UBC. La force, la vitalité, l'intelligence, la diversité profonde, l'incroyable créativité des gens présents m'a donné un espoir immense dans la génération montante, dans les nouvelles forces et la puissance de l'imaginaire de nos communautés. Je peux témoigner que ce prix-là est très important, apporte une visibilité exceptionnelle à nos œuvres, mais aussi nous permet de créer des liens entre nous. Et favorise le mentorat entre les écrivains, ce qui fait une grande différence pour ceux et celles qu'ils reçoivent, en particulier les écrivains émergents. En plus, j'ai eu le bonheur de partager le prix avec la, de la meilleure œuvre poétique en français, avec la grande poétesse Joséphine Bacon, une grande sœur, une mentor qui nous inspire, et que je souhaite remercier du, du fond du cœur pour son appui aux écrivains émergents et de faire rayonner notre littérature bien au-delà des frontières et d'en faire une littérature respectée et prisé partout autour du monde. Je n'ai que maintenant une Cette année, dans la catégorie poésie, deux œuvres se sont démarquées et remportent le prix ex D'abord, avec Brévière du matricule 082, Maya cousino Mola nous a livré un premier roman époustouflant, fébrile et bien ficelé qui transforme une colère dense en poésie engagée contre l'injustice et l'oppression et pour l'humanité. Brévière du matricule 082, révèle l'émergence d'une voix forte, courageuse, déterminée, empreinte d'une indignité affirmée et assumée. L'auteur a su utiliser l'art poétique pour nous faire entrer dans un univers unique, sensible, tourné vers l'universalité, capable de nous faire sentir à la fois la cruauté du monde et sa douceur et l'amour des êtres aimés. Ensuite, avec Chauffer le dehors, marie andré Guil nous a fait le cadeau d'un troisième ouvrage à l'esthétique polie et impeccable, qui révèle une écriture mature, accomplie, une, une vulnérabilité, une intimité déconcertante. La poétesse nous invite, avec douceur, une sincérité généreuse et humilité, à faire avec elle le dur portage, en partance de la peine, du vide intérieur et du douloureux manque de l'être aimé, vers un nouveau, nouveau rapport à soi, marqué par une relation renouvelée avec la terre ancestrale et honorant sa capacité à nous consoler et à nous guérir. Bravo aux gagnants! Dans la catégorie prose, c'est le magnifique roman Chouni de l'auteur Naomi Fontaine qui remporte le prix cette année. 
Avec Shuni, il écrivait Inou nous livre un troisième roman à l'écriture mûrie qui la confirme dans son statut de grand écrivain Inou. Avec les paysages de Ouachat en arrière-plan et sur un ton franc et empreint de bienveillance, elle y approfondit avec brio le thème du dialogue et de la vérité comme antidote aux effets pervers du colonialisme sur nos relations et fait l'apologie de relations plus saines et plus denses, que ce soit entre nous et avec les non-autochtones, qu'entre les générations et avec nos propres enfants. Alors, sur un ton intime d'une lettre adressée à une correspondante, Naomi Fontaine fait donc le pari de l'échange, de la compréhension et de la générosité en racontant avec force son univers intérieur dans un souci d'affirmer une voix indépendante et réaliste. L'écriture de Fontaine, bien enracinée dans l'imaginaire inno, aspire à porter des fruits pour tous, à construire des ponts et à réparer des relations mutilées par le poids de l'histoire, du racisme et de l'oppression. Alors, félicitations à la gagnante. Félicitations à toutes les gagnants et merci aux organisateurs des prix autochtones 2020, de même qu'à l'Association des études littéraires autochtones pour sa promotion des écrivains autochtones et de leurs œuvres. Bon été à tous et à mai. Hi, I'm Anne Doyon. I'm a member of the Indigenous Editors Association, and we're looking for a few new recruits. Uh, we're a newly incorporated nonprofit that came out of the Indigenous Editor Circle, and we're looking for people. You don't have to be an editor. We're looking for people who work in publishing, who work with stories, language experts, traditional knowledge keepers. Um, some of the benefits of joining is you will receive job postings, you'll be invited to participate in our future programming and webinars. Um, most importantly, you'll have a chance to influence the direction of the Indigenous Editors Association and our future plans. Membership is set at $10, but if cost is a barrier, please contact us and we can help. Uh, for more information on the Indigenous Editors Association, please go to our website at www.indigenouseditorsassociation.ca. Hello again, it's Smokey. Wow, what an incredible, incredible mix of work. We are so lucky, we are so excited to celebrate these emerging Indigenous writers. I hope you enjoyed their readings. I know I did. I know I they lift me up. Our work, our work helps us survive. And I feel like we're just getting to witness these pieces of the constellations of relationships from the ancestor storytellers to the to, to the indigenous aunties and uncles and all of the the elders in between all of our uh young old people <laughs> um and all of those yet to come and i think that's truly who this award and who all these readers who all this work helps right is to tell our stories and to continue our knowledges into the future so thank you to our readers thank you to our indigenous voices award shortlist And as you may have noticed, we didn't give them a lot of time, unfortunately, to uh, talk to you. Uh, they, so they were just reading because I think their work, their works needs to stand and you need to witness that. Um, but on behalf of all of the writers and authors shortlisted for the Indigenous Voices Award, we would like to thank you. And I'd like to acknowledge that as, as a writer myself and on behalf of, of all of these writers that we don't do this alone. As I said, we're lifted up and all of those people stand behind us, all of those people that paved the way. I think of a story that a uh, Haudenosaunee student actually taught me, his name was Bobby. And um, he taught me that, uh, he taught me about walking through the forest, right? And so if you're the first one, and I think this works in the bush here too, If you're the first one, it's really hard. If there's stuff scratching you, you've got to slash, like you have to slash through that bush. And if you're falling behind, you maybe get hit in the face with branches. It's hard to be that, even that second one falling behind. It's hard to be that third one falling behind. But eventually, as enough people walk that road, it becomes easier and easier. And so I would like to thank all the people that cut that path through for us. And I would like to thank all of the family and friends and relations that have supported us. It takes a lot of support to, to live with writers. <laughs> That's why I live alone. No, I'm just kidding. But, um, but I, I, you know, on a, on a serious note that, that thank you. I know that they want to thank their friends and family. I know that they want to thank their presses for those that are published, 
for all of the p presses, especially indigenous presses, um, and all of the presses out there that are supporting indigenous writers. This is a moment in time where we're excited. This work is coming forward. Uh, it's really constellations of care. Thank you to all the teachers of Indigenous liter all the, uh, literature, all the professors, the Indigenous Voices Awards, um, the, the, the judges, and, and everyone who's involved in these awards, and everyone who is lifting up our voices, and all of the readers, all of you out there. Uh, that's what makes this work possible. So thank you. And we would also, of course, like to thank our funders, Penguin Random House Canada, the Center for Equitable Library Access, Scholastic Canada, the Ontario Arts Foundation, as well as the hundreds of grassroots donors who make this, make these awards possible, to make the Indigenous Voices Awards possible. So um, a special note to writer and poet Pamela Dillon, thank you for all that you've done for us. And I would just, just, I think, I think I'd like to leave it by saying, I, I think I've said most of what I want to say, but I want to tell you, um, when I, when we first start learning our languages, I think one of the first things we ask is for a word, for the word thank you. Um, because in our world, we thank everybody, right? It's uh, thank you at Tim Hortons, thank you at the grocery store, thank you at the gas station, thank you for, you know, uh, doing the dishes or, or whatever you're doing. And so um, I wanted to use that and I started asking around, how do we say that? And in Tunaka, we have words, uh, we have a couple different words. So we have a word, or a, a phrase, I guess, Hunaka Nakanini, it means I nod my head to you. It actually comes from the Hail Mary, that's where that translation comes from. And so it actually is sort of has a, as a connotation of that humility, honoring that humility. And that's one way to say thank you. There's another way to say thank you that I've learned, and that's a phrase we say, husu kef kukni. And, uh, and when I first started asking about that phrase, I got different, I got, I, well, it means I'm happy, um, which is good. I am happy. That's, that's a, that's a miracle sometimes, right? So we're happy. Um, but later I got a, one of my favorite, uh, my, my favorite translations is the, the, cause I'm a poet, cause we're, we're talking about, we've heard some amazing poets, but um, the translation, my heart is happy. And I really liked that one. And then I was corrected. Uh, I guess not corrected. I was, I was taught. I was gently shared with. Um, and uh, Nasukin Alfred Joseph, uh, who is one of my elders and who is one of our chiefs in our community at Tunaka Chief. He's from Akiskanuk. And he said to me, oh, you know, he goes, people say thank you. It's not like thank you at the Tim Hortons. It's not like we don't, we don't throw it around. Um, but he shared with me, he said, you know, you have a day when everything's going hard. Everything's dark. Everything, it's all a struggle out there. Maybe your car got towed. Maybe you dropped a coffee cup and it spilled everywhere. Uh, things are just not going right. Maybe you're in the midst of a divorce. Maybe you're stuck with your spouse in a pandemic and now thinking about divorce. Maybe you're, uh, you know, maybe it's worse than that. Maybe you're in grief. Maybe you're struggling. Maybe everything feels very, very heavy. He said, then something comes along and it lifts your heart up. So to all of you out there, to all of you listening, to all of the writers and readers, and especially to the supporters of these awards, Husukil Kukni, you've lifted my heart up in the midst of everything we're going through. And I thank you for that. The last thing we say, it's sort of like what you hear out there, all my relations. The last thing we say is we say, Tacha, that's it. That's all I have to say. So, Husukil Kukni, Tachaz. Thank you.